explaining the aneurysm during the approach from gastrointestinal bleeding and from postpartum hemorrhage. So once a sensor begins using this, they realize that it isn't just for bleeding from, in, from injuries, from penetrating or blunt injuries, but it can be from someone who's having massive postpartum hemorrhage, uterine rupture, uh, <coughs> gastric arterial bleeding, and so forth. So there's other, other uses for it. It also tends to cause less physiologic disturbance than open for economy for cross clamping and has a higher rate of success. So you do know that actually finding and cross clamping the aorta can be a somewhat difficult part of the for economy. So the anatomy, the three zones of the aorta, the next in the minute we'll look at the next slide that, that actually gives a pictorial of it. But your two target zones are zone one or zone three. Zone one, just distal to left subclavian, is a longer target zone from there to the diaphragm, so just above the celiac axis would be zone one, which would be if someone is having bleeding from, obviously, from abdominal or below. Zone two is not a target zone. That actually is where your, your visceral branches, your celiac, SMA, IMA, and renal branches are. And then zone three is just distal to your renals and above the aortic bifurcation. And that would be a zone if someone had pelvic, either penetrating or blunt pelvic, or groin proximal femoral artery injury, where you did not need to have a zone one. Simply a zone three would be enough to actually get hemostasis for pelvic or lower. Move forward to the next. So those are our images. Zone one, again, larger target zone from the descending aorta just distal to the subclavian, to the diaphragm, and then zone three, after the renals, before your bifurcation. Zone two is not a target zone. A uh, little anatomy, thoracic aorta generally is about 20 millimeters in adult males, uh, narrowing to, to 15 distally, slightly smaller in females. There is an age-related general increase in that size. Um, external measurements, we, we try when we are, when we actually do the procedure, we'll look at this, but when you're generally looking for your measurement, zone one is the end of the balloon tip at the xiphoid, and zone three is at the umbilicus. Indications, PDA arrest less than 10 minutes, secondary to exsanguinating subdiaphragmatic hemorrhage. So if someone is dying from thoracic, the indications are still to open their chest because it isn't just for cross clamping, it's for direct repair, right? If someone has a gunshot wound that's through their chest, it's not just for cross clamping, it's actually for also evaluating a tamponade, you know, uh, it, cardiac compression, so forth. So this is for non-thoracics. This is for abdominal or, or in pelvic blunt or penetrating. The other indication is femoral vessels need to be identifiable by either ultrasound or by cut down. So if you cannot identify a <coughs> common femoral artery by ultrasound, then you cannot typically try to do a percutaneous approach to this. You either then you need to do a cut down to access it or then back to a thoracotomy. Um, severe hypovolemic shock, so that would be someone that is not necessarily in arrest, but they are in such profound shock state and either not responding, only partially, or is partially responding to volume loading. Um, and again, non-compressible exsanguinating hemorrhage, which would be again a non or partial responder. Um, once you've uh, excluded causes of obstructive shock, to make sure that it is not from a tension pneumothorax or not from pericardial tamponade. So again, we've mentioned this already somewhat, but the indications would be suspected or diagnosed intra-abdominal injuries with hemorrhage due to blunt or penetrating. That's where we would target zone one. Blunt suspected pelvic fractures would be for zone three or penetrating to the pelvic or groin. Right? So I'm sure people here have seen someone comes in with a gunshot wound directly to their thigh, femoral artery, and the person's already either exsanguinated or is currently exsanguinating, and it's difficult to get control of that. And sometimes the person will arrest, and in that case, prior to this, what would need to occur would actually be a thoracotomy to cross clamp the aorta for a distal injury. So that's why it would make sense to say if I can access the opposite femoral artery, common femoral artery, and just get to zone three above the bifurcation and, and inflate the balloon, that vessel will stop bleeding. So it does actually make 
good physiologic sense. Read the next slide. Contraindications. Again, age greater than 70, that may not be an absolute. The whole idea is that if someone is older and has already actually had massive hemorrhagic shock, then maybe they're not the best candidate, but I think that, that may not necessarily be an absolute contraindication. But not being able to identify vessels by ultrasound would be a contraindication for the percutaneous approach to this. Okay, you need to be able to say, I see ultrasound, I'm seeing my common femoral artery. Just a quick question on the indications again. For the postpartum hemorrhage case, is that a zone three? That would be zone three, yes, yeah. absolutely, since the hemorrhage would be all from, from pelvic and below. Uh, con other contraindications, cardiac arrest. If it's other causes, then from under the diaphragm. So again, if someone actually had uh, bleeding from their, from their thorax, one, because we're not actually obviously getting a balloon up into their, into their arch, but also because you would want direct control for th via thoracotomy. PARS, more than 10 minutes. That's, again, contraindications to doing any aggressive resuscitative care. Typically, at that point, you would be doing your cardiac ultrasound to see if they're an asystole and, and declaring them at that point. Or if you have a high suspicion that there's a proximal aortic injury, then you would not want to be putting that catheter balloon up. Or if the person had pre-existing conditions where you do not think aggressive resuscitation is appropriate. So the procedure steps, first it's going to be identifying the common femoral ar artery. And this is slightly different than what we typically do for placing A-lines. When we place an A-line, most of the time we're actually placing it probably in the SFA. We typically, by when we, when we go by landmarks, we're usually down in the thigh, right? We're not typically so close to our to our inguinal ligament because we're trying to, gratefully so, being cautious of actually having a puncture that's actually above the inguinal ligament. So we typically start several centimeters below. This is slightly different in that with ultrasound, when you identify this, you're virtually going to be right right at your inguinal ligament to see your common femoral artery. So you can identify it by actually tracking back and seeing <coughs> SFA and profunda coming together and forming actually the common femoral artery. And that's where you're actually going to be accessing this because the size of your catheter is too large typically to be in your SFA. You very likely would injure it or, or dissect it. Uh, as we talked about the measurements for either zone 1 at the xiphoid or zone 3 on bilicus, those measurements are for kind of a normal torso-sized person, but you're going to measure it directly. Um, the balloon inflation will be slightly different, again, because we talked about the diameter of the aorta is different in the more proximal compared to distal. And then you're going to attempt to do x-ray confirmation. If you're doing this and you know that you're planning ahead of time, it may be a good idea to even put an x-ray plate under the person as you're getting ready so that when you think you have your wire and balloon in position, you can actually snap the x-ray like that if you don't have fluoroscopy. But it is recommended that even before you inflate the balloon that you actually do an x-ray to check position. If you, if you don't have that ahead of time, go ahead and inflate the balloon and then get an x-ray to actually co co confirm your position. Securing the catheter so that it doesn't migrate when you're happy with the position. And then the obviously important step here is once that's in place, this is not a curative therapy. This is to buy you time. Once it's placed, the ongoing fluid blood resuscitation should, should continue while they're going to get their definitive therapy, which should be in the OR or IR. So once they get this placed, they don't go into further images. They actually then go for therapy. To the left is a picture of the, it's a little bit bright in here. You can see if it shows a little better. The one on the left is a picture of zone one without contrast in the balloon. You can actually, as you fill the balloon, you can actually mix, instead of just plain saline, you can mix a little bit of some IV contrast so that it actually shows the balloon on, on the right side that's actually the balloon in zone three, but it's inflated with contrast. It doesn't show as much on the, on the left side, but if you're a little closer, you can see that the catheter actually does have markings on it above and below the balloon, there's little hash marks there. So it's not the worst thing if you forget to actually have some pre-filled saline contrast mixed together. Contrast by itself is a little too viscous, it's harder to push, that's why they mix a little bit of contrast in with the saline. The kit that we currently 
have been using, although now with the newer, newer kit available, we'll talk about both. The Coda kit um, is a larger intro, introdu introducer. It's a 12 French percutaneous introducer. And you need to use a stiff guide wire that stays in place even when the catheter is placed because the arterial pulsations is enough to actually push and start to actually bend the catheter on the coda catheter. So for this, it's guide, it's introducer, guide wire, catheter, guide wire stays clipped and in place with the catheter in place. And a 12 French is large so that when this is eventually removed, an arterial, arterial orifice, arterial repair is required because you can't just remove that and hold pressure. So this is, this is the probably, quote, second generation. We talk about in the 1950s, 1960s, some trauma surgeons, uh, medical, uh, military surgeons had tried placing some catheters. That would consider that to be first generation. This would be second generation. And then probably the ER Baboa would be the modern or third generation. We'll look at that in a second. So that's a photograph of the, the blue there is the 12 French introducer. The yellow is the catheter, and what you see coiled up around the leg is the guide wire is still in place. So it's, it's more steps, and it actually obviously is a more morbid procedure that you need to have an arterial, re arterial repair after removing it. The ER Reboa is a 7 French introducer with a 7 French catheter. Um, the catheter itself is stiff enough that you do not need to leave the guide wire in place. As well, it, ha it has an arterial monitor above the balloon so that once it's in place, you can actually do continuous uh, arterial pressure monitoring in the distribution of what you're perfusing. So the beauty of that is that you can actually follow your resuscitation, and if you think the person is doing better, you can potentially deflate the balloon and give some distal perfusion or deflate the balloon somewhat for some of the current research going on is, do you need complete occlusion of the aorta, right? If you inflate somewhat and actually get an improved blood pressure in their brain and heart, everything is getting flow, do you need a complete occlusion? Can you have it where then you can follow distally that there is some transmitted flow so that the person doesn't have complete ischemia of their abdomen, spine, or extremities, and that's some ongoing research. So if you've inflated it, and their blood pressure is responding after their resuscitation, and now it's getting to the 30-minute mark, and you've not necessarily had definitive therapy yet, it is possible that you could, under controlled circumstance, begin to deflate the balloon. If their blood pressure plummets, then you would know that they're not a good candidate and would need to reinflate the balloon. So again, that's just a directly from the prior time site showing the balloon and a zone three in the, again, distal to the renal branches with it inflated in place. Next slide. And again, showing that for that zone three placement, yes, you can have a pelvic binder in place. It may need to be modified to allow access to it, but it would not necessarily mean only one therapy or the other if they're actually getting pelvic immobilization to do that and try to place if this was from uh, pelvic disruption from a, a severe uh, blunt pelvic trauma. And then I include this because this is a slightly different mentality to be thinking about trauma. Because right now, when we have someone that's a very bad tr trauma with hemorrhagic shock, the first thing we think of isn't, oh, let's place a femoral A-line. But it may be a reasonable you know, paradigm to say if someone comes in and they had hypertension in the field where they actually are, re are requiring some fluid and blood, even though they're not in either PEA or they're not systolic of 70, but you think this person is pretty ill, maybe reasonable to actually place a regular old 20, you know, 20 gauge A-line in their common femoral artery. In that way, you have it accessed and if they continue to either require more blood products or decline, it's much easier to then say, I'm going to put a wire in and exchange upsize that for my Rebola catheter. So this is University of Maryland's algorithm where they've started actually doing that for sick trauma patients. Now, if the patient never gets an upsize to a Rebola, but someone is ill and they're actually getting massive transfusion or they go to the operating room, you haven't done any harm by placing an A-line. The anesthesia in the ICU probably will be thankful. Oh, the person has, a, has an A-line in place already. Great. 
and it doesn't cost much uh, in terms of time if you start thinking about accessing it early on. So that's their algorithm. Access it. If it's not ever needed, fine. No, you know, no Reboa. If, it, if there is a positive fast, and so you think it's, again, upper, then you go to a zone one, and they go for laparotomy. If you think it's pelvic-induced, then it's zone three, and then they should be going to, again, either embolization or, or OR for other operative intervention. Last slide will just be some of the references. So the group at Maryland and from Texas are the two groups that have done the most with this, and the publications are still forthcoming. There's still a lot more registries and trials. So, yeah. Is is you measure, and so I think the the, zone, the zones the zones were referenced. Can everyone see all right? Yeah. Um, so the zones were referenced. So uh, external landmarks is kind of key. Um, and so for, for zone um, one, which would be for abdominal injury, you, you place the balloon halfway between the xiphoid process and sternal notch, just above, above the patient. And, and then you will uh, measure to your access point. So we got the, the balloon up, measuring to our access point. So on this particular patient, it's around 44 centimeters to our so access point. Between sternal notch and, I'm sorry, where else? Between xiphoid process okay. and sternal okay. notch. So for zone three, you're basically looking at the balloon uh, above the umbilicus. So balloon above the umbilicus to your access point. So for example, on this, uh, you're looking at around 23 centimeters on this particular model. Um, zone one, okay. So zone one, so you take your, 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 your POA, you'll um, advance it up, straighten out that P-tip like I showed you, and then you'll make sure, um, this is kind of where the nurse is coming to play, they'll make sure that the A-line is flushed. A-line is, I already flushed it on here, but we'll flush it, you can see, it's actually behind my monitor there, but uh, you'll, you'll, the A-line will not work if, unless it's properly flushed. And quite, oft, quite, quite often, uh, they'll have to reflush it um, because you've got the fluid coming towards, coming towards it. And in order to not have it occluded, you need to reflush it. So basically, you make sure that the, it's completely flush, and then you'll access, like so, you'll access the valve. Like I said, you'll just take your POA, advance it to the valve, just half a centimeter, you'll get your blood back, which is kind of what you want, advance it up. Once you get to about 17 centimeters, you can, peel, you can, you can pull that POA away. Most of the time, you will just peel it away. Um, and then, since we're going to zone one, I'm going about 43 centimeters, so I'm at 25, 30. I'm watching my arterial pressure, which I'm so, not sure why that's so not so showing so up so yet. The reason uh, we've been talking about it is... So they shouldn't be surprised. That's correct. <laughs> hey, we like to use... Nope, that's correct. They so I'm not sure why that's not working yet, but we'll, 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 just, we'll go ahead and basically what will be happening is my pressure will be changing as I was blowing that up. I will be looking for tactile confirmation <clears throat> as well as... Um, confirmation on my arterial monitor and then I would I would x-ray here we got a convertible chest so we can look at it pretty easily but you can see you can see it's it's occluded in zone one um, it's right in zone one uh, and basically that allows you to kind of like we talked about get from point A to point B what do you mean by tactile confirmation what are you feeling with that so good, basically basically You're what feeling I'm feeling it on the syringe or? exactly so okay. with the syringe we always recommend pushing with your thumb as opposed to your palm okay you're gonna get better tactile confirmation on that so the two the, the two things i'm looking for are my arterial pressure uh, monitor changing and and my tactile confirmation with my thumb and you roll up your 